you are listening to an After Dinner Conversation magazine podcast. After Dinner Conversation believes humanity is improved by ethics and morals grounded in philosophical truth. And that truth is discovered through intentional reflection and respectful debate. In order to facilitate this process, we have created a growing series of print books, a monthly short story magazine, and two different podcasts. This podcast, Philosophy Ethics Short Story Audiobooks, provides audiobook recordings of the stories that have appeared in our magazine. And our companion podcast, Philosophy Ethics Short Story Discussions, is where we discuss the ethics of the choices made in the stories as a way to model the kinds of discussions we hope you're having about these readings with friends, family, or students. We would love it if you went over to check it out. I'm Roberta, your narrator, and one of the acquisition editors at After Dinner Conversation Publishing. Thank you for spending your time listening to our podcast and for reading the magazine. Thank you for supporting us through your magazine subscriptions and through patreon.com slash after dinner conversation. And of course, if you enjoy this audiobook reading, please subscribe to our podcast, share it on social media, and suggest it to friends. Today's story is Survival Kit, written by Christine Seifert and published in our March 2021 magazine. Survival Kit by Christine Seifert I married Andy Morrison four months after we met. It was a mistake, the marriage, but I didn't realize it until after the wedding weekend. By then it was done. Andy had gone along with the marriage plan gamely though I guessed that was because I was only his second real girlfriend, and an initially gratifying position that turned sour when a few months after the wedding I ran into girlfriend number one at the car wash. We recognized each other immediately, and while I would have been content to simply hide behind the spinning rack of air freshener trees, girlfriend number one took off her giant sunglasses and said, I just want you to know, I don't envy you. Are you cold? Andy asked as he arranged pieces of newspaper over his legs. He was the only person I knew under the age of 50 who read newspapers on actual paper. No, I said, though I could feel the wind blowing through the cracks in the car window. It was still light out, just barely, but the late winter weather was bad enough that all I could see was a gray-white wall of snow. The cold was settling under my skin, around my bones, and threading through my blood. I'm glad we don't have the girls, he said. Can you imagine? His newspaper blanket fluttered. He was wearing children's earmuffs and gloves that couldn't cover his hands. Andy and the girls loved the desert dry heat of Arizona. All three wore winter coats if the mercury dropped below 60. What do you think they're doing right now? I asked. It was a game we played when we were alone. A conversation without stakes, one that never ended, even when it grew old. I think Natalie has already announced that she wants chicken McNuggets. His turn. Natasha has colored the walls and eaten glue at least twice. I laughed, but only to be polite. Natasha would never do either of those things. It was Natalie who ate anything she could wrap her grubby hands around. It was Natalie who once ate my birth control pills and required a trip to the emergency room. My parents pretended to love babysitting the girls, but they would all four be watching the driveway, waiting for Andy and me to pull up. I wrapped my arms around myself and tried to imagine a world without the girls. Without Andy, it was a picture that came easily and faded slowly. One by one, the figures disappeared. How long do you think we'll be here? Andy asked. It'll be fine. I said some version of that line to Andy a hundred times a day. Everything will be fine. I'll take care of it. Don't you worry. I'll do the heavy lifting. A snowstorm this bad wasn't going to let up any time soon. We were stranded, completely stuck, under a deep underpass in a flimsy rental car, a powder blue Toyota hatchback, and the snow was endless. Andy's parents attended the beachside wedding in Maui, but they had not been invited. Andy's father, a man the entire family referred to as Blip for reasons that I had never learned because not a single member of the Morrison family could remember. 
had sat in bird shit on a bench provided by the photographer. Susie and his mother had insisted the photographer pay for Blip's linen suit, a suit he had allegedly worn at his own wedding 30 years prior. The story had the literal whiff of truth. The suit smelled like mothballs. Even the wedding planner, a woman with cat's eye glasses, couldn't escape blame for the bird shit incident because the wedding planner recommended the photographer. Susie insisted I refuse to pay her sizable fee. When Susie threatened to sue the photographer, the wedding planner, and inexplicably the manufacturer of the bench itself for damages, Andy stepped in. Andy, who had a 28-inch waist and arms like kebab skewers, threatened to punch the photographer. The photographer laughed. Of course he did. Then Susie took over and the photographer blanched. Everyone on the beach witnessed the debacle, and there I was in my size 4 casual beach wedding dress I had gotten for $30 at Maurice's in Desert Sky Mall, watching Susie punch the man while Blip cheered. In the end, I wasn't sure who convinced the photographer to agree to a small refund on the photo package and apologized to Blip for suggesting he sit on the bench in the first place but I often suspected the photographer shot the photos in such a way to make me appear 10 pounds heavier than I was. The entire stack of discounted photos were now stored in the closet along with the purses I never used and my diaries from middle school. If the twins eventually asked to see them, I might very well tell them the photos were lost. After Susie swung at the photographer, I forged ahead with the ceremony for reasons I couldn't understand myself. It was a steaming chemical mix of duty, stubbornness, and a splash of something like love. Yes, Susie's punch had delayed things long enough for me to seriously consider running away. But I stayed. I stayed when the uniformed police officer arrived. I stayed for the statements that had to be made. I stayed while the wedding planner bought ice for the photographer who ended up with a black eye. And then it was time for the ceremony. Without even realizing it, I had made a decision— Action, after all, can be just a series of inactions. To come back from Maui with nothing to show but a sunburn and a pair of souvenir sea lion barrettes was unthinkable. It was bad enough that my parents would be hurt for months after the wedding. Here were Blip and Susie in every damn picture while my own parents shoveled heavy March snow and ate salmon loaf on TV trays. The bird shit story had been retold so often since the wedding that I could almost recite it along with Susie and Blip. Even years after the wedding, Blip's misfortune and the scene it caused were a reminder of that wedding weekend, the first of three things that solidified into a hard mass of memory, a tumor that grew and served to remind me when I was willing to touch that malignant lump that marrying Andy was a mistake, one that couldn't be rectified, not now. My wedding night ended with me alone in our Four Seasons suite, not because of Blip's ruined pants. Blip had been consoled by the all-you-can-eat pig roast, which my parents had paid for as a wedding gift. He stole bananas for breakfast the next morning and thus saved at least $20 by his calculations. Andy was unaware that I was upset, so I couldn't blame him for going on a sunset hike with a group of students from the University of Alabama ecology class he had met on the airport shuttle. That was the second thing that enraged me that weekend. The hike. What kind of man goes on a hike on his wedding night while his new wife sits in a hotel suite drinking pre-mixed Mai Tais and watching free HBO? They have their lights on. The engine is running. Andy pointed at the car a few feet in front of us. The only thing we could see in the swirls of snow and only just barely. They're turning it on too often. I fiddled with the keys in the ignition and wondered how often was too often to turn on the heat. We only had half a tank of gas, and I was pretty sure we were going to be in the car for a very long time. The snow wasn't letting up. I looked at my watch, quarter to six. It was a long time until morning when the plows would come through. Who do you think is next? I asked Andy to pass the time. Kathleen and Steve, definitely. No, I said, really? Kathleen and Steve? They don't even go to the grocery store separately. They're joined at the hip. Andy nodded, his head vigorously. Just watch. It's always those kind. 
You can't keep that kind of thing up. It was another game we played, which of our friends would divorce next. There had been a rash of separations and divorces that year, most of which did not surprise me. There were the usual reasons. Infidelity, lack of interest, boredom, existential angst. But none of those reasons seemed good enough for me to get a divorce. I had recently admitted that I had an old-fashioned idea of marriage, one that allowed for peaks and valleys, one that didn't factor in happiness. After six years, I had successfully become a person who follows through. Besides, divorce was so publicly messy, a kind of failure that they printed in the newspaper, one that followed you every time you had to mark a checkbox, single, married, divorced, failure. I think Steve is cheating on her, Andy said. Steve! I pictured Steve, bald before 30, a beer gut, an unsightly mass that fell over his belt and hovered above his crotch like a retractable awning. If he hasn't done anything yet, he will. He is a crush, a massive crush, Andy said. He giggled in the same way the girls did when they built a Lego tower and then kicked it down with their tiny feet. Some girl at work. She's 18. What would you talk about with an 18-year-old? I wondered aloud. I quit working when the twins were born, but before that, I had been a school nurse at a large high school. Eighteen-year-olds were like unformed pieces of clay. They were shapeless blobs still being molded by the universe in some pre-adorned way. I could not envision having sex with one of them any more than I could envision having sex with the lump of the girl's Play-Doh. Eighteen-year-olds are fresh meat, Andy said. You can convince them of anything. You can be a god to an 18-year-old. I turned toward my window and rolled my eyes. Andy was a narcissist. I'd only recently admitted it. I worried sometimes it was rubbing off on me. Andy was blowing on his hands as he talked. I followed suit. I imagined the Arizona sun in August. I'd take 114 degrees in a second compared to this snow dump, this March nightmare. I didn't know how my parents stood it. I didn't know how I'd lived the first 18 years of my life here. Had I ever thought Andy was a god? The temperature was dropping by the minute as the sky turned to true night and the snow fell faster. If not for the snow, if there was any hope we'd be able to move the car soon, I would not have responded as I did. Is that what Roxanne thinks about you? That you're a god? Andy laughed. Not nervously, not guiltily. Roxanne is too smart for that. She's 27. She called the house before we left, I said. His newspapers crinkled as he shifted in the passenger seat to look at me. I told her we were going on our anniversary trip. She just wants to make sure everything is fine while we're gone. She's a real peach, I said. But it was a pointless comment. Andy didn't understand sarcasm. He was like those people who had face blindness. Sarcasm could be presented to Andy, introduced by name, but he wouldn't recognize it the next time. Does she call your dad at home? Who? I looked at him to see if he was playing dumb. He wasn't. He just had no attention span, not even trapped in a hatchback under a bridge, not five miles from my parents' house. I'd suggest walking if either of us had boots. Though with such poor visibility, we'd probably end up frozen to death in a snowbank before morning. Never leave the car. My dad had drilled that into my head. If you are stuck, stay put. I sighed. Roxanne, does she call your dad at home? Andy shrugged. Probably. She takes her career seriously. She didn't call to talk to you. She called to talk to me, and not about her career. Andy jabbed at the radio button, his hand steady, his face impassive. Ooh, yeah. Roxanne was something of a girl Friday for the Morrison family business. Blip and Andy did the jobs. Susie kept the books, a feat of magnificent proportions given that Susie couldn't even balance her checkbook and had been charged with misdemeanors twice for writing bad checks. Blip himself had been arrested once for stealing a turkey breast from one of the chain grocery stores, their biggest client. When pressed for an explanation, Blip merely said, I wanted a turkey. 
Blip had never cheated on Susie, a fact that he recited often. Though he had cheated on the three wives prior to Susie, one of his favorite pastimes was telling Andy about his pre-Susie conquests, the secret trysts he had arranged while one of his dim wives sat at home and waited for him, like a lighthouse keeper. Blip always ended his stories with the same line, I could do it, so I did. Don't you want to know what Roxanne said to me? He didn't answer. The car wasn't big enough for Roxanne, too. The third thing, the biggest regret, was the worst. The one I forced myself to think about every time I got too comfortable. It was like an antidote to comfort, a quick reversal if life became too pacific. On the last night in Maui, Blip and Susie invited themselves to our honeymoon suite for Mai Tais and pineapple chunks, impaled by plastic toothpicks. Particular favorites of Blip, who believed drinks and hors d'oeuvres could catapult a working-class fellow who owned a failing window-washing business in Phoenix to the sort of middle-class gent who had a portfolio and more than one necktie. It hadn't happened yet. Blip and Susie perched on the edge of the bed and made off-color jokes about honeymoon sex. Andy laughed. It turned red at the tips of my ears. In truth, Andy and I had disappointing sex precisely once since the ceremony. We had had sex hundreds of times before Hawaii, and everything had been fine, if not earth-shattering. But the wedding had soured everything. After the vows, I couldn't help but notice that Andy looked a tiny bit like Susie. Why had I never noticed they had the same hazel eyes, the same curling wisps of hair right at the temples, the same pale skin prone to sunburn and moles? Susie insisted they cap off the evening by walking out to see the cliff diver. Each night at sunset, a man-boy in a tiny bathing suit climbed a craggy cliff and dove into the ocean depths, all for a smattering of tourist applause. Susie and Blip had seen the diver every night. They had the videos to prove it. Blip posted his favorite on his Facebook page. Amazing natives, he wrote, totally unaware that he was being racist. We were all too early to the cliff, and we had to wait for the diver to begin his ascent. Blip loudly wondered if it was a different diver each time. He didn't know because he couldn't tell them apart. When Andy told him to shush, Blip feigned ignorance. He changed the subject and asked Susie if she got a look at the diver's package. Then he roughly began massaging Susie's shoulders and told the family of five from Toledo standing next to them that old Suze needed a good rubdown. I was perpetually mortified by Blip by his crassness, his inability to apologize for anything, his base thoughts laid out bare for the world to see, his complete unawareness that he was constantly taking up space and air that could be better used by someone else. We ended up missing the diver because Blip began an impromptu Charleston-style dance to the sound of the Toledo father's ringtone. The Toledo family laughed too hard, I thought. Even the baby seemed amused. I wondered if I had ever found Blip funny or charming, but I couldn't remember ever having felt anything except the mantle of hot annoyance and disgust that I carried on my shoulders whenever he was around. After the dive that we didn't see, Blip suggested a cup of Irish coffee. Before I could say no, Andy said yes. At the Hilton bar, Blip asked the bartender where she was from. Sydney, she answered, her surfer's body tanned the same color as the whiskey she poured into Blip's coffee. The bartender added an extra splash and winked. I thought, people actually like Blip. It was a great mystery of the universe. Susie ordered a sex on the beach. Andy and I got gin and tonics. Two rounds later, Susie was on the dance floor with a middle-aged man in a Tommy Bahama shirt and a black fedora. They danced to Eye of the Tiger. Susie's pancake butt tapped his belly every so often. Andy was telling the bartender about brine shrimp respiration when Susie cried out. Blip had already put his head on the bar and was fast asleep. A flap of gray hair rising up and diving down as the fan behind the bar oscillated. Andy went to the dance floor to investigate, and I followed close behind my gin and tonic sweating in my hand. Tommy Bahama held his hands up. Hey, I don't know what the problem is here. I'm just having a good time. Go to bed, I told him. Susie's hip had crapped out again. 
the same one that gave her trouble before. She'd be miserable until she could see her orthopedist. The plane ride home would be torture. Andy offered to stay behind in Rouse Blip. I would escort Susie back to her room. Stay with her until she gets her nightgown on and her teeth brushed, Andy said. Not for the first time, I wondered if this is what it would be like to be a parent. Reduced to monitoring someone else's hygiene. When I finally became a parent, I would learn that it basically amounted to directing food into the mouth and waste out of the body. Susie was in bed, loaded up on four Advil and the after-effects of alcohol by eleven. Blip showed up a few minutes later, wide awake from his coffee and nap. I left Blip in Susie's room without saying goodbye. You don't have to be polite to people who ruin your wedding, I thought. At three minutes before five, hours after I had left Blip and Susie, Andy returned to the honeymoon suite where I had spent the night on the balcony watching the waves roll in and out. He wept for twenty minutes before he could tell me what he had done. We both wished he was better at keeping secrets. The wedding disaster was six years ago. A year or so later, the twins arrived. And what could I do with two babies and no job? Fortunately, by then I had figured out that Andy was significantly more likable when nobody else was around. He was like a German shepherd who, in private, picked up a book and asked if anyone had thoughts about Russian imperialism, but in a crowd of people would pee on the rug. Day-to-day life wasn't bad. It wasn't pleasant or fulfilling, but it had a rhythm. Lip and Susie were crosses to bear but I wasn't sure how I could possibly divorce them, even if I left Andy. Your parents are caricatures, I said, as I rubbed at my ankles in the freezing car, trying to get the circulation going. It was so cold, I worried we'd both fall asleep and forget to run the heater at regular intervals. They are characters, Andy answered, and I wasn't sure if he was correcting me or mixing up the two different words. Yes, but they are characters nobody would believe if you didn't know them. If I made them up, people would say I tried too hard or that I painted too broadly. You do do that, Andy said. You like to be annoyed by them. It was a long-standing argument, whether I was too sensitive or too humorless or too prudish about Blip and Susie. I had to admit that I was secretly delighted that the twins were wary of both grandparents. Their identical little eyebrows raised whenever Blip spoke to them, as if they were puppies rather than human children. It was more worrisome that both girls had started to give Andy the same look. I checked my watch. Not five minutes had passed. My phone said at least three more feet of snow was on its way. I had already called my parents who advised me to stay put. I can't believe you didn't put a winter survival kit in the trunk my father said, without hiding his irritation. I forgot, I said sheepishly. I had been living in Phoenix for so long that I had forgotten about northern winters, the way snow could sneak up on you and change your plans in an instant. I think I should try to walk to the car ahead of us. Maybe I can get some food or blankets. We have less than a half a tank of gas. Another winter sin, not keeping the gas tank full at all times. Can you see to the next car? Andy asked. I can't see a thing. He was right. It was a full whiteout now. I'll be fine, I said. I hope so. He didn't offer to walk himself. I knew he wouldn't. Not just because he was wearing flimsy Converse sneakers that would be soaking wet in seconds. I looked in my shoes. Sturdy leather knee-high boots. Not ideal, but better than sneakers. If I kept a straight line, I'd be fine. You didn't need to see in a whiteout. You just needed to keep your bearings. I'd hold the rental car until I had to let go. I'd make the leap to the bumper of the next car. I've seen worse than this, I said. I hadn't. Not ever. I'm starving, Andy said. We had been on our way to dinner, a belated anniversary celebration that couldn't have reminded me less of Hawaii if I had planned it. It was my idea to take an anniversary trip to visit my parents. Andy had resisted, 
a lifelong Arizonian, he found the idea of snow a personal affront, a hassle Mother Nature sent just to fuck with him in his steak dinner. Somebody will have food, I reassured him. I was the chief of the Reassurance Bureau. I got things done. And if I didn't, I convinced Andy all would be okay anyway. Somebody will have food, I repeated. The rest of these people wouldn't have forgotten their winter survival kits, because they weren't idiots from Phoenix. Give me those gloves and earmuffs. Andy handed them to me. As I rubbed my fingers over the material, I wish I had bought real outerwear, not the cheap stuff from CVS. Fare thee well, Andy said. I turned the ignition. Go ahead and have some heat. Then it will be warm for me when I get back. Andy smiled and leaned back in his seat. Ah, heat, I have missed you so. I could write an epic ballad all about heat. Well, you've got all night. I didn't say goodbye when I pushed open the door against the wind and slammed it behind me. The force of the snowy wind almost knocked me over. Even so, I inhaled deeply and sucked in the cold until I was full. After Andy finished weeping that morning in Hawaii when we had just an hour left to pack and catch our airport shuttle, he told me the truth. Or a version of the truth. After Susie had left the bar, Andy had roused Blip and sent him back to his room. But rather than coming back to the honeymoon suite, Andy had decided to go down to the Four Seasons bar for a quick drink. He'd bring it back up to the room, maybe even grab a snack, a sundae or something for us to share. The University of Alabama Ecology Group was out by the pool, he decided to say hello, see what they had been up to, if they had any exciting plan to news. Andy dropped out of college sophomore year, but he fancied himself an autodidact, a word he actually used in regular conversation to describe himself. It was pedantic. It also wasn't true. I waited for him to admit it, that he had slept with someone else. Blip's pre susie extramarital affairs were genetic, and here was the proof. I felt a strong wave of something that might have been elation. If Andy cheated, it wasn't my fault. I was the victim. And didn't that change everything? Wasn't that a perfectly good excuse for an annulment? We sat together on the foot of the bed that night, and I willed my hands to stop shaking. Tell me the truth, I ordered. He wiped his nose on his t-shirt sleeve. I didn't try to stop her. I made him repeat the story twice and then a third time just to be sure I had understood the details. There had been a girl at the pool, a girl in a skimpy bikini with gold rings at the hips. He bought her a drink, a strawberry margarita, and then another. They dangled their feet in the pool long after the other University of Alabama ecology students left. They walked on the beach. They kissed. Their toes dug into the sand, their fingers clasped. Just a quick kiss. Hardly a kiss at all. They stopped. Andy wasn't sure who stopped first. The girl, Brittany, of course, her name was Brittany, understood. He was married, and she was only 18, a freshman from Tupelo, and almost virgin. Brittany stayed on the beach, still drunk, and he came back to the room to his wife. He would never stray again, he promised. I held him in my arms, all the while wondering if drunk kissing was a big enough crime to warrant changing my ticket. Staying in Hawaii for a couple of days by myself, and then flying back alone to contact a lawyer. Were divorces cheaper if the marriage only lasted a week? I had a thousand dollars in savings. Can you forgive me? Andy asked. Do you believe me that nothing else happened? The second question surprised me. I had never considered for a minute that he was lying, that the kiss had just been the beginning of something worse. I looked at his huddled mass, his shoulders covered with the fluffy white duvet that I was sure the housekeepers didn't wash, not even at the Four Seasons. I never knew when he was lying. Never. You should have at least walked her back to our room. I was offended on Brittany's behalf. Was it too much to ask for an escort back to her room? It wasn't safe, not even in Maui, for a drunk girl to wander the beach in the dark by herself. What if something happened to her? What if she wandered into the ocean and drowned? Or fell into the pool? Or disappeared like that spring break girl? That one they still haven't found. I was filled with worry for this Brittany. 
I didn't do anything, Andy said. I didn't, I swear. Doing nothing is something, I told him. No, nothing is nothing, he insisted, his eyes red-brimmed and hollow. It occurred to me then, a lightning bolt from the white-painted four-season ceiling. Doing nothing was certainly not the worst thing in the world. Doing nothing wasn't an action. It wasn't a choice. It was a mode of survival, a way of being, a philosophy. I'll be better, Andy said, when we were riding down in the elevator the next morning to meet the shuttle that would take us away from Hawaii and the wedding and everything. From now on, I will be better. I chose to believe him. But everything. Brittany sent me a Facebook message just one day before we left Phoenix for our anniversary trip. It had been so long I had almost forgotten about Brittany, but not quite. I read the message. He just seemed so nice. He seemed normal. I trusted him. I said no. A day later, in the Phoenix airport, I locked myself in a stall and opened up Facebook Messenger and responded to Brittany. I believe you. The exhaust pipe mattered. You had to know something about northern winters to know about the exhaust pipe. Too much snow and you'd end up with exhaust filtering back into the car when you turned it on for the heater. If you were going to run the car, you had to keep that exhaust pipe clear. I wished I had a shovel. As it was, I had to use my hands with the tiny gloves, already a hole in each finger, to tunnel through the snow. I stood up and peered around the rental. I still couldn't see the car in front of me, not in the dark, with the snow bursting from the sky. Digging seemed futile. Every handful I threw seemed to flutter back down and settle around the undercarriage of the car. I could hear the soft hum of the little engine, the rumble of its innards as it produced heat for Andy, who was still nestled inside. I started scooping snow with both hands. Andy should turn the car off. We were using too much gas. The exhaust pipe wasn't cleared out enough. I thought of Blip and Susie. They were probably having drinks on their condo patio with neighbors. My parents and the girls would have eaten supper by now. Time for bed next. Stories, kissing, nightlights, blankies, reassurances that mommy would be back by morning. I gave up on shoveling with my hands and sat on the edge of the car's back bumper the snow and cold soaking through my jeans. I really should tell Andy to turn off the ignition. It was bone cold outside, but it was sort of nice, all alone, with the snow assaulting my face. Andy would nod off in the car. He could sleep in all circumstances, even when the girls were screaming bloody murder. He inherited that from Blip. How long would he breathe clean air with the exhaust pipe blocked? I'm doing nothing, I said aloud. What was wrong with that? Nobody could fault someone for coasting along, for letting things happen. As they happened, life unfolded. You didn't always have to be the subject of every sentence. Nothing wasn't something. Nothing just was. I stood up again and watched the snow building higher, swallowing the bottom of the car. Not doing anything wasn't wrong. I dried my hands on my thighs. Not doing anything was the sum of zero. The rental car was still running when I set out for the oasis ahead of me. Now for the discussion questions. Number one. The narrator doesn't seem to like her husband, Andy, or his parents, Blip and Susie. There is an assortment of things she says she doesn't like about them, but what is the real reason? Why has she never told them? Number two, Andy, Blip, and Susie all seem generally happy with their lives and fond of the narrator. Are they simply stupid? Why is it they seem so happy and the narrator so unhappy? Who's right in the way they live their life? Number three, Why did the narrator go through with a wedding that she didn't want to have? Why have children when you are in an unhappy marriage? Who, if anyone, is the cause of the narrator and Andy's unhappy marriage? 4. 
How would this marriage snow story go if told from the perspective of Andy? 5. If Andy was wearing similarly sensible shoes in the car, would the narrator have asked him to go to the next car? Would Andy have agreed to go if asked? If the answer is yes, then why is the narrator mad at Andy? And 6. If the narrator fails to dig out the tailpipe and Andy dies, will her life get happier in a year? Is she right in saying, regarding digging out the tailpipe, that not doing anything isn't wrong? That was Survival Kit by Christine Seifert. I hope you enjoyed our story. Next week, we'll be reading Give the Robot the Impossible Job by Michael Rook. If you enjoyed this story, head over to our companion podcast, After Dinner Conversation Discussions, and listen to our discussions of this and other short stories from our magazine. We will include a link in the description. And of course, you can always continue the discussion on our webpage, in the comment section, or on our Facebook page. Thank you for joining us. Until next time.